Hello, and welcome to another episode of Baz Codes. I'm your host, Baz. Um, I thought I would try to confuse some people today by actually talking about code. I know. Uh, no video game uh, s screen captures here today. Um, so as you know, I've been working on uh, improving the sound output, uh, the sound emulation for my Apple II emulator uh, called GS Squared. And, uh, you know, it, it turns into, essentially, it's a process of uh, conversion of sample rate. So the Apple II speaker can toggle on and off uh, a million times a second, in theory. Uh, at least that's the resolution, right, that you can do it. Uh, modern computer audio data is 44,000 samples a second. Uh, 44,100 to be specific. And the uh, um, and the process is, you know, converting from that high higher sample rate down to a uh, lower sample rate with higher resolution, uh, which is why it works. Uh, and that's a process called uh, down conversion. Uh, if you want to look that up, there's a whole sort of sub science to that in signal processing. Uh, it's very interesting stuff if you're, you know, a math nerd. Uh, well, I might be. All right, so uh, the way my uh, emulator architecture works is I run everything, I break up into frames. And a frame is 60 frames a second, so a frame is 1 60th of a second. Uh, so I run emulated code for what would have been 1 60th of a second on an Apple II. It's about 17,000 CPU cycles. Uh, and then I generate a frame of audio, which is, you know, one sixtieth of a second of, of audio. And then I generate a video frame. And each of these 60 times a second. And then you get something that looks and feels seamlessly like the, uh, the original thing. Now, my original code didn't quite work right. I was getting audio distortion in the output. It, you know, it was workable. Um, and I thought it was pretty good. Uh... But then I, you know, fired up my real thing and started listening to how clean and crisp uh, the sound was compared to my emulator, and I knew I was going to have to do something about it. So uh, I dove into it this last weekend um, and did a lot of staring at code and, and thinking, and eventually I realized the problem was I was just missing some of this information. Uh, and the information I was missing uh, was because... I wasn't taking fractional cycles into account. So these two numbers, here's the Apple II cycle rate, and then here's the audio sample rate on the modern computer. Uh, these don't divide evenly. Uh, so you're left with cycles per sample of like 23.14 uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, so because it wasn't dividing evenly, my old algorithm uh, was uh, effectively discarding that fractional piece, which was enough to cause the, the distortions that were, you know, pretty audible. Uh, so I um, hacked fairly quickly once I understood the problem. I was able to hack um, a solution, and it involved using floating point, a bunch of floating point stuff to track these fractional bits that I had been essentially discarding before. Um, the, uh, the solution worked well, and it um, gave me something that looks basically like this. So let's run this. Oop. There we go. All right. So uh, that sounded pretty clean and crisp, and it's the Apple II speaker tone. Um, I've got a little function in here that generates a, a wave at 938 hertz, which is, I think, the speaker tone beep. Of course, that was three seconds long, not one-tenth of a second long. That's all right. So the, the meat of this routine is this loop, where, you know, for each sample, which is the bigger chunk of information that we're going to send to the sound card. Um, we're calculating all of the contributions to the audio signal uh, from each Apple II cycle. Now, it can change. Uh, the polarity of the speaker can change while you're doing this. 
So that's what this function call here is. It says, hey, if this cycle index um, is um, related to an event where that speaker polarity changes, then we've got to take account of that and change the polarity. So that's what um, that's what this code does. Anyway, this 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 loop runs a lot, right? So it's um, there's 23 point some cycles per sample. Uh, each time this function is called, we're generating 750 uh, samples. So, you know, and, and ultimately it's going to run a million times a second uh, because that's how many Apple II cycles there are. And this is basically counting Apple II cycles. So um, without having to, um, you know, pull out a, a certain kind of uh, profiler, uh, I was able to focus at this code. But as you'll see, I did from the get-go um, take care to measure instrument this and measure the actual amount of time it's taking to execute. So I, I did all that at three seconds worth. I measured the whole thing. I divided it by, I guess, 180 for three seconds worth of frames to get um, 55 microseconds per frame. Now, that's not bad. Um, 55 microseconds still leaves me plenty of room. I have 17 milliseconds per frame to get work done uh, before I risk losing um, frames. Uh, but, you know, I thought I could do better. And, and the old code, admittedly, the old code didn't work. But the old code emitted something that was like, you know, passable uh, in six microseconds. So... Uh, I um, took another stab at it. Uh, now, this iteration of the code is all floating point, right? I'm counting the cycles in floating point, uh, I'm counting the contributions in floating point, uh, all these fractions are in floating point. It's all floating point math. Now, I figured I would be able to uh, maybe convert some of this stuff in here to integer values. So I did that. And that resulted in this version of the code. So everything else is the same. I just changed this inner loop. And you'll see here this cycle index is now an integer. Um, and we're essentially circling through here as an integer instead of adding to floating point. All the other floating point stuff is still there. Let's compile that. OK. So we just went from 52 down to 44 microseconds. Uh, now, for each one of these, I will normally run the test repeatedly. Uh, any any given invocation you don't know, you know, due to caching or other things going on in the system, whether uh, any particular number is accurate. It's really an average of these. But uh, you know, we honed in on an area, we made a improvement, and then we measured. And that's the key. Um, that's the key thing here with the the process. It's instrument, measure, and then iterate, right? Um, if you try to optimize before you've done any measurements, you it's called pre-optimizing. You might be optimizing something that doesn't need it, or something that doesn't matter. Um, so it's important to, as a programmer, always um, be scientific about it. Right, measure, uh, and then figure out from the measurements uh, what can be improved where, and or whether even what you're doing is uh, an improvement. If you're just eyeballing it, you know you might trick yourself into thinking that uh, you made it better when you didn't, or when it made no difference. Uh, okay, so I knew. Okay, so I knew I was onto something here, and a lot of CPUs floating point. Certain floating point operations are just as fast as integer operations, you know, if you're just doing some basic ads. But, you know, I'm doing some, I'm doing some multiple multiplication and a bunch of other stuff. Here I'm, you know, scaling a sample up to 32,000. There's just a bunch of stuff that's happening. So I said, okay, let's do this again. And let's, let's integerize even more stuff. So that gave me this, which I, I did as a new function because I had to change variable definitions and whatnot. But now 
all of this stuff is an integer, like the cycle index is an integer, my sample index is an integer. Um, polarity, I mentioned it has to be floating point. Uh, and I, I, the only floating point stuff I'm tracking and doing math on, but though at this point, is what's left over, those little fractional leftover bits. So um, the, the new algorithm looks basically the same except um, I've got more integers stuff and I've and I'm taking care to only do floating point when absolutely necessary so you know the fractional bits that are left over um, the the difference that fractional left over is the same every time based on your your sample rates so I was able to not calculate that in the loop every time, calculate it once outside, essentially, reuse, reuse that. Um, that helped a bunch. Um, just doing the simple check here, the fractional leftover is either more than a cycle, in which case we just do another integer cycle, or it's less than a cycle, in which case we just do a little bit of you know fractional math here. Uh, and and that's that. So let's see what this looks like now. Okay. Um, that was faster than I expected. Why is that? Oh, because I forgot to save it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Let's run that again. There we go. So now I'm down to um, 3940 microseconds. So we've gone you know, we've made it like a 20% improvement and that's not bad, but I knew that there was going to be one more thing I could do here in this inner loop. Where is it here? This inner loop is getting called, um, is running a million times a second. This function is running a million times a second. Uh, it's doing a lot. Uh, so, but there's situations where the polarity of the speaker is not changing in the middle of a sample. So I said, well, maybe we can just shortcut that. If it's not going to change in the sample, uh, I, th I bet we can just do one calculation to take care of the whole sample. Uh, so that's what I'm going to put in here. And... Right. So if there's no polarity change event in this sample, then we just get to do one floating point calculation instead of a looping 23 times and doing a bunch of stuff 23 times. And let's compile that and see what we get. Wow. Okay. There we go. So we're from 52 microseconds. We're now down under five microseconds. And um, there's still a couple things we can do. And these are easy. These are freebies. Um, the first thing is um, C++ lets you do this cool thing called inline, where basically it'll just take this code and shove it inside um, the function that calls it as if it was native. So you, you save the uh, function call overhead, pushing things on the stack, pulling things off the stack, all that stuff. Um, let's see if that makes a difference. So I'm at 4.9 microseconds. Hmm. That did not really make a difference in this case. Um, the compiler might've been doing it automatically for me already. Um, there is uh, there is one other thing we can do, and this is low hanging fruit. Uh, I didn't have compiler optimizing on, so this is where the compiler cleans up its own code, and and some of your code, uh, so that um, uh, it's it's more efficient, and it can do incredible stuff. Like people could hand code some of this, but the modern compilers are really smart and can make dramatic improvements. Uh, so let's try compiling with the uh, heavy optimizer on. So we were at 4.9 microseconds. Okay, there we go. 
So we just got another 20% by turning on the compiler optimizer. So we're now down under four microseconds. So I've got this code, which works much better. Uh, for, as far as I can tell, it's sort of perfect. And it runs uh, in less time than my original broken implementation, just because of a focus on um, measurement and iterating uh, based on what you learn from the measurements. So I hope you've all enjoyed this. This is a little insight into my obsessive compulsive brain. Uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't do this for everything. Um, there's parts of this, you know, large project that there's no point in trying to put this kind of effort into uh, this level of optimization. Uh, but for this, something that runs 3,600 times per minute um, and, and is, is such a visceral, immediately felt, right? People hear it, right? Direct goes directly into their brain. Uh, element of the system. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to focus some effort here. So um, anyway, I hope you learned something. Um, if not, um, you got a little look at the, this code. This will get pulled into uh, GS squared proper here shortly. This is a standalone test harness uh, that I can use. Um, that's another thing, uh, test-driven development, right? So I've been doing a lot of this recently with this project, which is building a function as a module, uh, its own library, that can then be easily referenced by a standalone test program so that, um, you know, the, instead of starting the emulator, booting virtual floppy disk, running an application, checking to see if the sound sounds better. Here I can just directly do the thing, um, and it dramatically speeds up uh, testing. You can also, um, you know, compare to test data. So as you do your iterations, you check uh, it, that the results are the same that you got the last revision, right? So it's a very powerful way to know that you're making improvements while not also breaking stuff. Uh, so anyway, that's how we do it uh, here at Baz Codes. Have a good night and oh, like and subscribe, please. It helps us out a ton. Really appreciate it.